Hello and welcome to the channel. My name is Waldo and in this video we're going to be picking up where we left off in part one. We're going to be building custom toolboxes, cutting out the sides to make the wheel arches, adding rub rails, lights, doing wiring, and fully welding this thing. If you missed part one I'll put a link up in this corner and also down in the description below. This is Billy Bob, my GMC C3500 HD. I paid $300 for this truck, essentially saving it from being scrapped. This project has turned into a full-on resto mod, complete with a paint job, a custom gauge pod, custom headliner, and leather bucket seats. The engine is a 24-valve 5.9 Cummins out of a Dodge Ram. The transmission is a 5-speed Eaton Fuller out of a medium-duty Freightliner. The goal is to end up with a heavy-duty truck for towing and hauling future projects. There's been a lot of welding, a lot of cutting, and, shall we say, a lot of persuading. It's a Thursday afternoon and I have a little over 500 PSI of welding gas. That means I better hurry up and get welding so that I can use this bottle up and exchange it before the weekend. I generally don't take weekends off even though the local welding store does and it sucks to get stuck without gas over the weekend. Now ideally, I'd like to remove this flatbed from the truck, which will give me better access underneath it for welding and wiring. But before I can do that, I need to do quite a bit more welding on this to strengthen it. As of right now, the deck and the sides are only held on by tack welds. I'm not confident that the tack welds are going to be strong enough to prevent the bed from deforming or breaking when it's lifted off the frame rails of the truck, so we're going to fully weld the deck just to be safe. Now, as for these butt joints between the deck plates, I already beveled them before I installed the plates, which is going to make my life a lot easier. Beveling the joints gives a place for the weld material to go to fill it up so that you have full penetration in the finished product. I'm going to have to limit my welds to short segments, and I'm going to have to move around quite a bit to prevent warping and distortion caused by heat buildup. We are all out of gas, so I guess I will give myself the rest of the day off, and then we'll go pick up some more tomorrow. Tomorrow. All right, so I picked up some more gas, and the deck is largely welded in place. At least it's welded enough so that I think it should have enough strength to maintain its structural integrity after I remove the bed. Oh, and the price to exchange a bottle of gas like this at my local welding store went up by almost 20%. But then again, everything's going up in price right now because that's just what happens when we print a lot of money. But I digress, I'm not going to go into a rant about monetary policy here. So for the next part of the project, we're going to build what is basically a set of legs for the bed. These will allow me to lift the bed up and support it to make removing the bed and reinstalling it much easier. To make the legs, well, we're just going to use some square tubing here. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this piece of tubing, I'm going to weld it to the bed right about here and then I can fabricate some legs that will stick into this come down here they'll have to go out underneath the bottom of the bed and down the side that's so that once the bed is lifted up and I drive the truck out the wheels obviously have to miss the leg if it came straight down the wheels would hit it that wouldn't work so it's a little bit awkward but I think this should work just fine now before I install these, I'm going to weld a plate onto the end of them so that when I stick the tubing in this end, it doesn't just come out this end. The plate will stop it from doing that. And then before I weld these in place, I am going to weld a nut on here, actually two of them. And when I insert a bolt into this, it'll act as a set screw to hold the leg in place so that it doesn't fall out. Oh, 
I don't have a lot of options as to where I can mount this because the toolbox is gonna be here, but thinking probably just mount it something like that. This is 3 16 plate back here, so it should be pretty sturdy. So next I need a piece of tubing that's about 10 inches long to get below the sides. And I'm gonna use two inch tubing here for the upper part of the legs. And then on the other side here, it's inch and three quarters tubing. That's gonna be for the lower part of the legs. From here, it looks like we're gonna to need to come over at least five inches to clear the edge of this. All right, so this is what we have. This is the part here that attaches to the bed, comes down. This is the part that goes out and underneath the sides. And then this is the part of the leg that will go down and it'll house the smaller piece of tubing that's telescoping that will come down and actually come in contact with the ground. So I just have to weld this together. Yeah, so I think we'll let these cool down. We're gonna call it a night and we'll come back to this in the morning. The morning. All right, so this thing goes in here like so, all the way up to the top. Tighten those up just a little bit. And that pr looks pretty good. I measured it so that it would be about a half inch underneath the side here and also about a half inch uh, past the side here. All right, so the tires need to go underneath this bit here. And if I had this about 31 inches off the ground, that's probably the bare minimum that I need in order to get the tires to fit underneath it. Although if I assume say maybe 35 inches, that will give me plenty of extra room just in case. It's already about 19 inches off the ground. So if I make the lower telescoping leg able to lift this up 16 inches, then I think I should be in good shape. So I'm gonna use half inch pins like this to stick through the lower and upper parts, and that's gonna hold them together. So I need to go ahead and drill a bunch of holes in these so that they're height adjustable. Time to break out the mag drill. I already broke the coolant bottle on this, so I'm just gonna be spraying cutting fluid on with this little spray bottle. All right, so this is where we're at so far. I ended up making this leg and welding a little foot pad on the bottom of it so that it doesn't sink into the ground or whatever else is underneath this. I drilled a hole on the side of this, and well, there's one on the other side too. I welded a washer onto it on both sides because the wall of this tube is a little bit on the thin side, so I'm worried about it getting all wallowed out. So welded those washers on there to thicken it up, so I think that should be good. The next thing to do is to add a jack point to this. I'd like to be able to use a regular old floor jack to be able to jack this up and I just got to figure out how far out this needs to come from here. And probably a bit over three inches, we'll, we'll call it three and a half inches just to be safe. Probably the easiest way to do this is to use the snap trick, so let's give it a try. Nice.
Yeah. I mean, it works. The bed is bolted onto the frame of the truck, so obviously it's lifting up the whole truck, but yeah, that looks pretty good to me. How many pounds of MIG wire do you think it takes to build a flatbed like this? Well, I just finished up a spool of it, and I've been keeping track of how much I've used so far. So by the end of this video, I should be able to tell you exactly how many pounds of MIG wire I've used. I also got the rear legs done. These were a lot simpler because they could just come straight down. While the camera was off, I got a little bit carried away and I welded on a couple attachment points to mount a spare wheel. These are pretty simple. They're just pieces of 3 16 angle iron with a hole drilled in them. The nice thing about this is that when there's no spare wheel here, there's nothing sticking out. It's pretty unobtrusive. And also, theoretically, you could mount other things here as well. Cool, it fits. Now having a spare tire is important to me because I wanna be able to have the peace of mind that you get knowing that you have a spare tire in case you need it. Not only that, but the tires that are currently on this truck are really old. So initially, before I get new tires, I definitely wanna have a spare. Now, if we look over here at the front tires, you can see this is the date code right here. It says 4105. And what that means is these tires were made in the 41st week of 2005. And that means that these tires are about 16 years old. They really don't look too bad for their age, considering that they do have a lot of tread life left. But that being said, it's definitely time for a new set of tires. One of the first things that I'll be doing when I start driving this truck is going to get a new set of steer tires. The rear tires back here are also dated 2005, although I'm less worried about these because, well, mostly because they're duals. And if one of them blows, it's not really that big of a deal. So while I will eventually get new tires for the back, it's not as high a priority as getting new tires for the front. And that's one of the reasons why I wanna have a spare because if I'm driving around and one of these does go, I'll be able to find a safe spot to pull over, change the tire and not worry about it too much. As to whether or not I keep the spare tire mounted here over the long term, well, only time will tell. But this is a very utilitarian mounting location. It doesn't get in the way of the lights up here, and it also doesn't block rear visibility too much. I can still see out of the rear view mirror, although if I do turn around sitting in the driver's seat, then it does block my visibility somewhat. But having a backup camera will definitely help with that issue. All right, I think that might be enough for me to drive out from underneath it. So with the bed up in the air and the truck out of the way, I have a lot of room to get underneath here and finish up the welding. Now most of the welding that needs to be done is welding the deck to the C-channel. And for this, I'm not gonna be fully welding it. What I'm gonna be doing is called stitch welding. And that's basically welding maybe like a few inches and then skipping several inches and then welding another few inches like that. It's really not necessary to fully weld the whole seam. I'd just be using more MIG wire than I need to. And also by fully welding it, it also takes away some of the flexibility that is a good thing to have. So stitch welding it allows some of that flexibility so things are less likely to break. Now, a couple things to keep in mind when you're doing overhead welding like this. First, you wanna keep a really short stick out. You wanna make sure you get that contact tip really close to the weld puddle. As for pull or push angle, you want it to be pretty close to 90 degrees. It's okay if you get a little bit of pull or push, maybe about five degrees in either direction, but you wanna keep it pretty close to 90 degrees. 
And then as far as the angle in this direction goes, you know, right about 45 is the way to go. That's probably a slightly longer weld than I wanted to do, but you know, it's okay. And then we'll just do that like a million more times and I'll be done welding on the deck. Yeah, so there we have it. We got stitch welds all the way down and I am glad to be done with overhead welding. So I think next I wanna do the rub rails. I'm really just putting off doing the toolboxes as long as I can because it's pretty complex with all the close dimensions, the hinges, the latches, all of that stuff. So going on here is gonna be some 3 8 inch by two inch flat bar. That's gonna be going on the outside and holding the flat bar away from the sides is gonna be these four inch by approximately inch and a half pieces of C-channel. Maybe I should tack all these on before I fully weld them. I don't know, just in case I wanna change their positions. So with these tacked on, they look pretty good, so now I can fully weld them. Now, right now I'm doing from the fuel filler forward, which comes to, we'll call it 92 inches. I can probably just clamp this in place. Let's see if I can do it with one hand. Leave a little bit of a gap here on the end so that I can fill that in with a weld bead. These are both pretty thick pieces of metal, so we'll turn the welder up quite a bit for this. The clamp even gives a place for my hand to rest. Fantastic. As for this end here, I think we can just use a clamp to bend it and meet up with the side here. Beautiful. I wanted to take a moment to follow up on these welding gloves. I've had these for about a year now and they're holding up great. They have reinforcements in all the right places, and once you break them in, they're really comfortable to move your fingers and your hands. If you're looking for a solid pair of welding gloves, there's a link in the description below, and I think that you will love them. Heck, even if you don't do any welding, surely you handle hot stuff once in a while. These would even make great oven mitts. All right, so the rub rails are all installed. We got the back and the sides. We got the fuel filler cap tucked in there so that if anything were to like rub by it, it won't hit it and damage it. So for the next task at hand, how about we cut open the circular openings for the wheels? Now I've already welded these two panels together up here. I didn't bother welding them together down here because I knew that I'd be cutting this part out. Also, before I removed the bed from the truck, I marked exactly approximately where the center of the wheels is here so that I know where to center the circular cut. Now we're gonna use the plasma cutter to cut out a circle, but the trick is, how do you make a nice, smooth, even, perfect circular cut? All right, so here's the plan. I'm gonna take this, which has a hole drilled in it. I'm gonna weld this to the side such that the center of the hole is where the center of the circle that I'm gonna cut out is. I'll figure out exactly where that is, but it'll be approximately here. And then I can take this, which also has a hole in it, I can bolt it there, and the other side has a circle there where the plasma torch will fit in. So then this will let me trace out the circle that I need with the plasma torch, and it'll be a nice even circle. Right about there. Pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 
Oh goodness. I was kind of expecting that this might fall on me, so I'm like ready to jump back and I, yeah, it was a little bit more dramatic than it needed to be. All right, adjustable hammer to the rescue. I don't know how hot it is. There we go, nice. Yeah, so I think it looks pretty good, but the true test will be once this is reinstalled on the truck and we have the tire filling up this gap, we'll see how that looks. I did make the circle a little bit bigger than the tire, but I only increased the radius of the circle by one inch over the size of the tire, so I don't think that it's going to be too big. I think the tire should fit nicely inside of the circle. Let's do some lights and wiring. So the grommet goes in first, press it in like that, and then we can just pop this in like so. It's almost like I rehearsed that once off camera. All right, so as for these plugs, they just take some standard trailer wiring connectors. The oval lights have three pins and the smaller lights only have two pins. These already came packed with silicone grease, also known as dielectric grease. It's really important to keep corrosion out of these. Otherwise, you're gonna have really unreliable lights over time. And then as for the three wire connectors, I got the wrong ones. I don't know if I ordered the wrong ones or if they sent me the wrong ones. I mean, I knew that they don't look like this, so I'm not really sure what happened. In any case, I need eight of these connectors and it looks like it's gonna be about a week to get them if I order them online. I did check and Tractor Supply carries them, but they only stock like two or three in each store. So I think I'm gonna need to go to like three different Tractor Supplies to get these connectors. The things I do to try to get videos out on time. That's just one of the reasons why it takes so long to get videos out because stuff like this happens fairly often. All right, we got the new connectors, we're good. I bent and cut up some pieces of 3 16th inch round bar and I'm gonna use these as attachment points so that I can secure the wires to the bed with zip ties. Well, with all these things welded on, now I know exactly which path the wires are gonna go. So I think I'm gonna start with all of the wiring by wiring in all of the grounds. Now, all of the backlights are gonna use this right here. There's a nut that I welded on as a ground point. And all of the lights in the front are gonna use a nut that I welded on up there as a ground point. The advantage to doing it this way is that I only have a couple of ground points to worry about, and I don't have to worry about running ground wires from front to back. An alternative is that I could actually ground each individual light after all, they do have ring terminals installed, but that's an awful lot of ground points to have to worry about. I'm gonna drill a hole up here so that I can route the wiring through the tubing of the headache rack. It's kind of a big hole, but that'll let me fit these connectors through without removing them from the wiring harness. I am gonna have to remove all the wiring before I coat this thing. And then on the bottom, the wires will go up right through this hole, through the deck, and into the tubing. I need a snake to try to fish the wires through. There it is. Advantage of having a big hole. We've got four wires going up on this side. We have ground, we have the tail lights slash running lights left turn signal and brake, and then also a wire for the white utility light up there. As always, all of the connections will be soldered and covered up with heat shrink.
So I have pretty much all of the wiring done at this point. The only big thing I have left to do is to wrap all of this in split loom. But before I do that, I think it's time to test this out. How I plan to hook this up to the truck is actually a seven pin trailer wiring connector because the truck already has one of these. So this is really easy to just plug it in and unplug it if I want to disconnect it. And then this is also wired into another trailer wiring connector that will hook up to an actual trailer. The cool thing about these connectors is that this has every single signal that I need for all of the lights on the bed. I'm just gonna use a car battery to power this thing. So we should have reverse lights, very good. What do all these other ones do? I don't know, let's figure it out. That would be the right brake and turn signal. Ooh. Oh, okay, that was ground. <laughs> so now I know not to do that one again, whoops. We have the left brake and turn signal. We have the tail lights and running lights. Yep, the ones in the corners work too. And there we have the work lights. Those are pretty bright. As for these red lights up here on the headache rack, they're currently not wired to turn on with the tail lights. However, I did run the wires in order to enable that feature so that if I do want that, all I have to do is make one connection down underneath the deck. I also quite like the look of the orange marker here in the corner, although I think it looks better in person than it does on camera. All right, I can't put it off any longer. Let's make some toolboxes. Now, before I removed the flatbed from the truck, I measured that the toolboxes can be 20 inches deep. They are, let's see, 11 and 11 sixteenths of an inch tall and 50 inches wide. So we're using a mix of eighth inch and 12 gauge for this. I wanted to go with 14 gauge, but my steel supplier didn't have any. So I ended up going with 12 gauge and then this eighth inch is just what I had left over from other stuff. Maybe I should have supported this better. I almost got it off. Hi, Aspen. Oh, what a good girl. Did you get any chipmunks? You may have noticed the seam here. Not all of these pieces were quite long enough to fit and I was about a couple inches short here so I'd had to join two pieces together but this will be up top and you'll never see it.
Because the hinge takes up some space, I'm going to cut off about a quarter inch from the height of the door. Alright, it closes pretty nicely. So for weather sealing, I'm going to be welding in these pieces of eighth inch by three quarter inch flat bar all the way around. So for the top piece and for the sides, there's going to be weather stripping on them and they have to be a very specific depth in so that it seals properly. So what I've done is I've clamped these together. We have a couple pieces of steel here which will get me the right depth. And then this one here lets me just kind of align it to the exterior of this. And so all I have to do is put this in place and I can kind of just hold it in one hand, weld it with the other hand, and it should be right. I'm going to throw a 45 in here just to reduce the corner radius needed for the weather strip to seal this. It's now time to make the catch for the latching mechanism. And this latch mechanism is going to go right about here in this approximate area. i got to figure out exactly how far back it goes. That is important. One of the nice things about this, I do have it down a little bit, but that allows me to stick the weather stripping on this, and this shouldn't get in the way of it. So I figured out that all I need to do is use an eighth inch spacer to get this lined up properly. That's not going anywhere. All right, for the moment of truth, should we see if this thing closes on its own? It does, look at that. It's not quite as flush as I wanted, but it does feel like it's pretty firmly up against the weather stripping, so I think it should be fairly weather tight. The one on the side ended up being pretty much perfect. That's nice. Aspen, up. Good girl, good girl. Well, here it is. I will let its looks speak for itself. 
Now, before I end the video, I have to answer the question of how much MIG wire does it take to build a 12 foot long skirted flatbed with toolboxes for a dually truck like this? And the answer is 23.9 pounds. As for shielding gas, I had to go back to the welding supply store twice to exchange my 80 cubic foot bottle. Well, this is the end of part two. In part three, I plan on hot dip galvanizing this and then painting the sides to match the cab. And I think I'm gonna go with a gray bed liner for the deck. And one last thing, I just wanted to say thank you so much to all of you who are new to the channel. The video for part one has done really well and the channel has more than doubled in size since I released it. Thank you so much for watching and we will see you in the next one. All right, off. Good girl.